All right, welcome back to another edition of Financial Accounting. We're going to jump into Chapter 2 here, starting with Learning Objective 2.1. Um, we are already seen how companies produce financial information through financial statements. So now we're going to get into the nitty-gritty. How do companies actually get information into the accounting system? And it starts first by recognizing transaction. Transactions are any events that have a financial impact on the business and can be measured reliably. So some sorts of, of invoice or receipt that gives us objective information about what has happened in the business. It provides objective information about the financial impact in an exchange. So a transaction from a pictorial sort of a view is if this is us right here, something is given and something is received. That's the exchange we're talking about. And the nature of the exchanges are financial. So what we have to do in the transaction is identify what was given a value and what was received a value. And in accounting, we record both sides. We don't just worry about what happened to us. We worry about how, what, it's not just about what we received, it's about how we received it or why we received it. There's no free lunches in accounting. When we're recording information about uh, certain transactions, we're going to set up several different accounts to keep track of all the pieces of the transaction. Uh, accounts are, record all the changes of particular assets, liabilities, and equity during a period. We've already seen some certain accounts. Uh, for assets in particular, recall that we saw cash. Cash was a major account. Assets generally represent resources that provide the future benefit. Other accounts Accounts other than cash would include things like prepaid expenses. And I don't really like this phrase because it sort of implies an expense. Prepaid expenses are not an expense. Expenses generally show up on the income statement. But a prepaid expense means that we spent cash. Money was paid in advance for things like insurance, advertising, or, and rent. Cash went down and something else of value like insurance went up. That's what a prepaid expense is. It's an asset. It will have its own account to reflect the fact that we exchanged one asset, cash, for another one, insurance. Over time, this prepaid insurance asset will end up on the income statement as an actual insurance expense. But for right now, it's just called prepaid, prepaid insurance. We can also spend money to acquire investments. If we have extra cash lying around in the business, we can buy stocks of other companies. That's a great way to bring in extra cash that, that is otherwise would do nothing. We'll have different accounts for long-term assets. So we'll have an account for land, account for buildings, and account for equipment. We'll also have liabilities for all of our debts or payables. Generally speaking, liability accounts all have the word payable in the title. So accounts payable. Notes payable. Accounts payable is one of the biggest ones. It's a promise to pay back debt. It's usually contractual in nature. Like with our credit card company, we have a contract that says if we use our credit card, we promise to pay the credit card company back the money that we owe. If it's a note payable, it's usually involving some type of amount borrowed, like a loan. And it involves a note because a note is a legal document that indicates that we promise to pay back a certain amount of money that we borrowed as well as interest at a future date. But the word payable appears in these titles. If you see an account called accrued liabilities, it's still a liability, but it generally means that we had to make some sort of guess or estimation of an amount that we owed. So if we have to accrue a liability to say, hey, we have to pay an expense in the future, we're incurring, we have to pay an amount of cash in the future, we're incurring expenses right now, what amount do we have to pay later? We may not get our bill until next year, but we need to make an estimate right now. We'll go ahead and accrue an accrued li we'll go ahead and accrue a liability and we'll just call it accrued liabilities to differentiate it from the other payables in the liabilities. In stock in the stockholders equity section, we know common stock represents stockholders' claim to the assets of the business. We know about retained earnings, that will be its own account. Generally, I like to think about accounts as buckets. And when it comes to retained earnings, this is particularly useful because retained earnings, we know, includes net income and dividends, the historical net income and dividends. But net income is not an account. Net income is the net of all the revenues and expenses. So we'll create these buckets for expenses and we'll create buckets, i.e. accounts, for revenue. 
As we earn revenue, we put revenue into revenue accounts. As we incur expenses, we put expenses into those accounts. At the end of the reporting period, we will empty these buckets out into retained earnings and to make those revenue and expense accounts ready for next year. We want empty buckets at the start of a reporting period. So net income does end up in retained earnings, but it does so by emptying out the revenues and expenses, the net effect of those being net income. We'll also have a dividends account bucket that will also eventually get emptied out into retained earnings as well. But the important thing to realize here is that we can create several thousand accounts and there's lots of them that we need. Some of them are just temporary. These are all just temporary accounts where we record transaction information. We will empty out the net effect of these buckets into retained earnings at the end of the reporting period to start fresh next year. How do we figure out the impact of a transaction on the business? In other words, if we have all these accounts and we use them to track um, the business, the transactions, at what point in time do we start using these buckets, these accounts? Well, that's what transaction analysis where transaction analysis comes into play. And it's extremely important before we start recording anything that we actually think about how a transaction affects a business. So imagine we start a service-oriented business called Aladdin. It's a travel service, kind of like a consulting business. Assume the first transaction on April 1st, we uh, get a bunch of cash, 50,000 cash from friends to help us start our business. We are getting cash. We always want to ask ourselves in transaction analysis, what we get versus what we actually have to give for that. Remember, there's no free lunch. If we got cash, and the question comes down to what is given to our stockholders? Well, what we give to our stockholders is ownership interest in our company. And we record that in those are legally show, show up as stock certificates. So what we're going to do is show both sides, both what we got and what we gave. We received cash, so we'll set up the cash account and show an increase of $50,000. That's what we got. What did we give? Under stockholders equity, we show how much in stock certificates we gave to our investors, $50,000. That account goes up as well. Remember, when we're doing this, we have to worry about what we received and what we gave. Somewhere in each line here, you will see what was given and what was received and at the same time, we'll also make, have to make sure that both, at, both sides of the equation balance. Total assets must equal total liabilities and equity every step along the way. An alternative way of looking at the first transaction, it may be possible that our friends and family don't have cash to give us, but they have other things of value. Let's just say they have equipment and supplies and inventory that they're willing to give my company, and the total value of that, let's just say, is $50,000. That's fine. I prefer cash, but I'll go ahead and still record the common stock of $50,000. I'll still show reflect the fact that I have given away ownership to my friends and family, and I'll set up individual asset accounts. I'll have an asset account for my inventory. I'll have an asset account for my supplies. I'll have an asset account for the equipment. Instead of cash, I'll create these other buckets, these other accounts to reflect what I received. Again, both the left side and the right side must balance. Realize that it is possible that we can issue stock and get something other than cash, but generally we prefer cash. We can also issue stock to get services. So maybe we want to hire a lawyer to help us set up our business, but we don't have the cash to pay the lawyer. Could we offer stock ownership in our business? Sure, we could. Generally speaking, such things don't happen very much in the real world. Let's go back to our original transaction where we have 50,000 cash and we have 50,000 in common stock. What do we do to the cash? In this case, we go ahead and buy land, decide to purchase some land to set up our operations. What do we give in this case? We give cash. So again, ask yourself, what am I giving? What is being received? Okay. Cash is going out, land is coming in. So in this case, the right side of this equation is not being affected. What I'm doing instead is, is treating one asset account for a new asset account called land. So cash goes down, 
land goes up. Overall total assets don't change. And that's an important thing to remember. Transactions can affect only one side of the accounting equation. Assets may go up and down, increase and decrease, so there's no impact on total assets. It's also possible we only see transactions affecting the right-hand side as well. But just be aware that that is possible. You don't have to have one side and the other side being affected for one transaction. An alternative way of looking at transaction number two is to say, hey, maybe we don't want to pay cash for this land. Well, that's fine. Most companies prefer when they're buying big long-term assets that they actually enter into a bank loan. So let's assume we get, we get the land, <clears throat> but instead of giving cash, what we give instead is a promise. Uh -huh. Some people call this getting a loan from a bank. I don't like that term. What, when you go to a bank and you borrow money, you will get cash. If you arrange it with a title company to acquire a house, in that case, what you're getting is the house. You're not getting the cash directly. You're just getting the house. What you sign in exchange is a promise to pay back the bank. A promissory note is a legal document that says, I promise to pay back a certain amount of principal plus interest at a future date. This is a good thing because I'll still show I have land as my new asset. That account will go up. And I'll still show that I have cash of $50,000 on hand. Total assets in this case, $90,000. Instead of using cash, though, I had to incur some debt. Not necessarily a good thing, but if that's my option, I might prefer to do that. We can talk later about why a company can justify doing this. My abilities go up, and I still have my common stock of 50000 So the effect of this is 90000 on the left, 90000 on the right. Most companies, it's important to note that most companies will borrow money for, for these major purchases. And the reason why is to protect the cash on hand and to allow for flexibility and pay for things on a day-to-day -day basis. Another thing to keep in mind is that companies will prefer to buy um, revenue-producing assets so that way and pay it back later with a, via a loan because they don't want to use cash right now. They want the the land or the equipment or the building to help generate income in the periods ahead. And from that income, use that net income to help pay back the loan plus interest. That's another strategy, another reason why long-term assets tend to be financed with a bank. In transaction number three, we're returning back to the original example where we have $10,000 cash, $40,000 of land, and $50,000 of stock. In transaction number three, what we're gonna do is go ahead and buy some supplies. Now, we can use cash to buy our supplies. It often makes sense to go ahead and acquire supplies on account. So in this business, we buy supplies on account, meaning we didn't pay cash. Think about this term on account as, in this case, buying supplies. We used our credit card. That's one way to look at this. We'll talk more about um, how we acquire, how, how we set up different accounts with other companies later on. But for right now, think about buying supplies on the account is we're not using cash. We're actually just kind of promising to pay back the money layer later. So what did we get? We got supplies. What did we give? It wasn't cash. We gave a promise to pay back the money later. So in this case, we save our cash, but we get supplies. So we'll go ahead and create a supplies account to reflect the fact that we have new supplies. That account goes up because we got them, and we're going to create a new liability account called Accounts Payable. Accounts Payable represents a short-term liability we promise to pay back within 30 days whoever supplied us with the supplies. So in that case, we will show that our debt has gone up. We see an increase on the right side and an increase on the left side, but overall, both sides still balance. We always want to check that. Assets increase, liabilities increased. If we paid cash, as an example, if we paid cash for the supplies, we would see assets increase for the supplies and assets decrease for the cash. That's an option. In this case, we decided to pay back, pay it back our supplier later. That's why we have the account payable. Accounts payable generally do not require a promissory note. Promissory notes generally imply that we get a loan, a long-term loan from a from a bank. Accounts payable, just pretty much a contract that says if we do, if we choose to use our line of credit, we have to pay back that money later. 
In transaction number four, Aladdin earns $7,000 cash from providing services. So ask yourself, what did they get? What did they give? In this case, it says we got cash. So that's good. What did we give in return? Must have been something. Well, in this case, if we're getting paid money, we want to make sure that we have some sort of offsetting um, account that's being affected. So in this case, we're simply saying that we provided effort. We provided services. We did something. When you think about the effort that we provide, think revenue. The idea of earning and revenue go hand in hand. We must have done something to get that. So we put forth our time and our energy to provide our clients and our customers with some value. So we see cash goes up on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, under retained earnings, we show a plus $7,000, meaning our overall net worth has gone up because we provided value to the world. We're a value provider. Generally, and you'll see this later on, is that when we record this, it will appear in its own account called service revenue. That's just one of the many revenue buckets at our disposal. Revenue account will be increased directly, but realize because revenues all end up in retained earnings that we reflect the effect of revenue as an increase to retained earnings indirectly. Service revenue is a bucket. It falls under the retained earnings umbrella. Go ahead and, and we'll, we'll talk more about this in the next learning objective too. So don't worry if this is still kind of a hazy concept to you. Remember that revenue is value given. Uh, when we recognize revenue, we're, in, we're showing that our net worth has increased. We are a value provider, so that's what revenue is reflecting, that we can provide value to the world. So our overall net worth has gone up. The cash is our tangible evidence that reflects that. Revenues on the income statement increase net income. Net income is not an account, but it does appear on the income statement. Net income, because it's increased through revenues, increases overall ending retained earnings. And ending retained earnings increase is shown on this statement of, of retained earnings as well as the balance sheet. So the idea here is that if we earn revenue, overall stockholders' equity is going to go up. The only question is which asset goes up in conjunction with that. What if we perform services, but the person doesn't have cash available to pay us? Well, in this case, we perform services on account. It's a similar notion to us buying, um, buying supplies on account, only this time, we're not promising to pay back somebody later. Someone's promising to pay us back later. So people pay us later. That's what this represents. What did I give? I gave effort. Again, think revenue. What did I get in return? It wasn't cash. It was a promise to receive money down the road. So I still need to record the fact that I provided revenue. I've provided value to the world. I'm going to record service revenue. That affects overall retained earnings. It's not cash that's being, that I'm getting as value. People are making a promise to me, and I'm going to show that as an account receivable. Accounts receivable is like an account payable in the sense that promises are being exchanged before cash actually gets moved around. So this accounts receivable of $3,000 will eventually end up in cash over time. I just have to be very careful about collecting it down the road. Also, this account receivable is a legally enforceable amount that I can collect. Worst case scenario, I can take the, my customers to claims court and demand that the judge force the people to pay me this $3,000. Generally, I don't do that. I usually just settle out with a collection agency that get some sort of cash from this. But for right now, I will, try, I will use good faith. I will exercise good faith that my customers will pay me back later. A promise to receive anything has value. Any type of promise, a promise that we get from our customers or a promise that we give to um, our suppliers and vendors. That promise has value and that promise is worth its weight in gold. We don't want to take that for granted. So if we've earned revenue, even though we don't get cash, we can still record a receivable to reflect the fact that value has been received, even though it's not in the form of cash. Be very careful. If you ever work in a, generally speaking, you want to follow through with your promises. But if you make a, if you are allowed to pay money later as a business, 
you want to take that very seriously because the bottom line is if you don't pay your debts, you may find the option to acquire loans or, or acquire goods on account shut out. You don't want to be blacklisted in your industry or in your local community. In this case, Aladdin announced during the month, Aladdin pays $2,700 for rent. So they have rent. Um, they pay uh, 1100 of that 27 goes to rent. Salary is 1200 Utilities, 400 What did we get? What did we give? Even if you don't know right off the bat, if it's not very clear about what was received, think about what was given. Up above, it says that we gave cash. Fine. I can draw that out. I gave cash. The question is, what did I receive in return that's valuable? Well, in the case of rent, I got the benefit of using space. In the case of labor, I got the benefit of someone else's hard work. In the case of utilities, I got the use of lighting, heating, flushable toilets. These are all good things. And that's what I'm trying to um, remember when I'm doing transaction analysis. Something must have been received for what I gave. So down below, I'll go ahead and recognize on the right-hand side under retained earnings, these negative effects, um, these reductions to retained earnings as a result of expenses. Expenses, again, show up on the income statement. We will set up separate accounts for rent expense, salary expense, and utilities expense. Those will appear on the income statement, and eventually those expense accounts will be emptied out into retained earnings. So for right now, just realize that, hey, we got the benefit of other people's hard work and labor. We're just showing that effect on the statement of, on the retained earnings on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we want to show the reduction of cash to reflect the fact that, hey, we had to consume resources. We consume resources to get the benefit of rent, salaries, and utilities. You got to spend money to make money, folks. We pay $1,900 on account. What the heck does that mean? Well, we're paying cash. So what we give cash, that's pretty straightforward. But what does it mean when we pay on account? What is it if we gave cash? What did we get in return? Paying on account means, hey, we're paying off an amount that we owed other people. So down below, recall that accounts payable. You have to kind of look at transactions, not in isolation, but as kind of like a, like a continuing story over time. We are doing something that perhaps is the result of a prior transaction. So a prior, the prior transaction in this case was we borrowed or we promised to pay back $3,700 for those supplies. Remember the supplies from the previous transaction? Now we're actually paying off that liability. So we're going to reduce that by $1,900. We also reduce cash by 1900 in this case. Why? So in this case, I know what I gave cash. What did I get in return? I got debt relief. It feels good to pay off my liabilities. So in this case, paying down my liabilities, I look at that as a good thing. I'm now relieved that I don't have certain amount of certain people looking over my shoulder waiting for me to pay them back money. Gave cash to re get debt relief. Remember, there's no free lunch in business. You always get to ask yourself what was given and what was received. Generally speaking, you can identify those things. If these concepts are relatively new to you, don't worry. We'll, we will revisit several of these down the road as well. This one I kind of hesitated to put in, but it's a fair point to bring up. It's possible that what looks like a transaction isn't really a transaction at all. In this case, it says major stockholder Aladdin Travel paid $30,000 out of her own personal account to remodel her home. Well, nothing's really required from Aladdin's point of view because given the entity assumption, personal business is not to be mixed with company business. Just to emphasize the fact that uh, employees and stockholders, they may have some sort of relationship with the business, but that doesn't mean their personal affairs need to be recorded or dealt with at the business level. Aladdin collects $1,000. 
Okay, it got cash. Cash comes in. What did it give? Well, this is collecting, uh, this is the amount of the $3,000 owed from a customer. This is also known as collecting on account. So down below, recall that we have that accounts receivable balance of $3,000, right? Well, in this case, people are paying down that $1,000 and giving us the cash. Ultimately, that's what we wanted. We just gave them a little bit of time. And it just goes to reemphasize the fact that eventually accounts receivable end up as cash. One asset account goes down, the other one goes up. One thing to keep in mind, and this is kind of sad to admit, but small businesses, uh, one of the reasons why small businesses fail um, early on is because they fail to collect on their accounts receivable. Failure to collect on accounts receivable results in a failed business. All the more reason to remember that promises have value attached to them. Transaction number 10. This one seems kind of strange to me. Think about this. Now, the company had to sell land, $22,000, to get cash. So it got cash, but it had to give up another asset, land. This concerns me because we acquired that land for our business. So generally, I don't want to see a business selling off its fixed assets, its long-term productive assets, just to get cash. But it could just be that this company is selling off some of its assets because it needs cash for an opportunity to grow the business in some other way. So hopefully when we need cash, we can just rely on the bank to lend us some money. In this case, when we need cash, sometimes we have to sell off our assets. One, uh, one asset goes down, the other one goes up. There's no effect to the right-hand side. In transaction number 11, we decide to, given our successful business, pay a dividend as a reward to our shareholders. So we're going to give out cash in the form of a dividend. What do we get in return? This is going to seem kind of strange, but we get happy investors. And the notion of giving investors cash seems sort of counterintuitive. Shouldn't the investors give us cash? Yes, as seed money to help us grow our business. But it's not like they just don't want anything in return. We, they want to see the company grow. And as the company does grow and makes money, they, we want to pay out some of those earnings to our investors in the form of a dividend so that way they can see a return on their investment. So paying dividends makes happy for happy investors. But not only that, we want to keep our existing investors happy. We also want to attract potential new investors. So if we do pay dividends, that could potentially catch uh, the eye of potential investors who want to invest in our company and help it grow. So that's another good thing. Another reason why paying dividends is a good thing. It attracts potential new investors. Keep in mind when a company starts paying dividends, it generally does not stop paying dividends. It will continue to pay dividends in perpetuity. But if a company starts paying dividends, generally there is a stock price bump. If the stock is publicly traded on a stock exchange, paying out dividends will increase the stock price. If our investors are unhappy for any reason, they will likely sell our stock, which will do, result in a stock price decline. Point of the matter is this, we want to keep our investors happy as much as possible. Dividends are a way to do that. Please keep in mind that dividends are not an expense. They're just an amount that's pulled out of retained earnings and given to the stockholders as a reward. But I can see why they're kind of confused like expenses because like expenses, dividends reduce overall stockholders' equity. <clears throat> now, all the information that we just did is summarized here in this spreadsheet. But realize this is not what we want to give the general public. This is just a chronological list of events and their effects on the various accounts in our company. What we need to do to make this information useful is summarize it. So what we can do is look down the list here and see what kind of activity happened and figure out where it can end up on the on the in the financial statements. So notice we have these revenue items and these expense items. Those revenue and expense items will end up on the income statement. So we will pull this information out and we will make sure that we show clearly on its own statement the fact that we earned net income. We also want to reflect that the company paid out dividends, but that information is buried in the spreadsheet. We want to highlight this 
That's why we need a separate statement of retained earnings. So we can clearly show that even though we made 7,300, we paid out some of our of that money to our investors to make them happy. Other transactions will appear in the balance sheet in some way, one, or, one way or the other. Down below is where we summarize and report all the information. This is definitely what we want to send to the general public. We want to extract from the spreadsheet, we want to extract all the income statement effects and put them in their own financial statement. Make sure it's clean and clear. Oh, hello. Make sure it's clean and clear how much in revenue was earned, what the expenses were, and whether or not any net income was earned. In this case, there was transferred down into the statement of, stock, uh, statement of retained earnings, and we show that the company's overall equity has increased by 7,300. Not only that, but we want to pull out. We want to pop out down below, emphasize that, hey, this we don't just make money. We also return it to our investors as a thank you. So this information is much cleaner and much more straightforward than just giving out a spreadsheet like this. Again, this one is this this information you see on the spreadsheet is only 11 transactions. When you think about a business and encounters thousands of transactions in a day, millions in a month, you can't give them this type of information. It's not clear. This is a much cleaner way of presenting that information. What we're going to see in the next uh, set of learning objectives in Chapter 2 is the specific accounting methodology that we use to record transactions and put them into these accounts and later produce these financial statements. If you have any questions, please let me know.